Today is lesson number nine, and today we continue our study of, of our Lord Christ and his life. And, and last week we spent two hours on the resurrection, the two hours we spent on the resurrection. First of all, last week, of course, the descent into hell, and learned, of course, that was not part of his suffering, but that was part of his uh, exaltation, that the descent into hell took place uh, right after his resurrection. Then came his appearances here on earth to various ones, but all of that was uh, part of his state of exaltation. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, we looked into that. That's the very foundation of our Christian faith, I guess, that Jesus Christ is risen. We would not be here today, of course, like I said last week, if it were not the fact that Christ is risen. See, that's just such a huge, huge thing, you know, that Jesus Christ is risen. Those those uh, three great words he has risen. Look at uh, Romans 1, 1 through 4, uh, where Paul points to this great truth again. And uh, that's on page 939, 939, where he points to the resurrection and that speaks to us and says that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and all of these kind of things. But look at that, would you please? 939. 9.39 says, one through, I'm going to read 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. But look at that passage again. First of all, he talks about the coming of the Messiah, and that's in how he was promised in Holy Scriptures and how that was fulfilled. And uh, in this very special one who is a descendant of David, according to the flesh, but declared the Son of God and the Messiah, all of these things through his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, the resurrection, of course, is, is such a, like I said just a moment ago, such a, a very, very big thing, the foundation of our faith. Those, ever think about this, you know, a question that can be asked is this, who or what was it that changed the cross uh, into an, em, from an emblem of uh, hate and, and uh, um, changed it from bad news into good news? Let's put it that way. What was it that changed the cross from bad news into good news? You know, in the ancient world, no one would have worn a cross. No one would have put a cross on their wall in, in the house. No one would have put a cross on the top of a building because that was bad news. That was a symbol of, you know, just a horrible, horrible thing. So what was it that changed the cross from bad news into good news? Well, that was the resurrection, you see, because out of the resurrection came this great truth that death had been conquered and the grave had been overcome and all of those kind of things. So today, the cross is good news. When you see a cross, that says good things about Jesus Christ, and about life, and all of those kind of things. Or about this question, too. What was it that uh, uh, impelled the disciples out into the world? What sent them out into the world? It was not their teaching. It was not Christ's teaching. Because on Saturday, Friday afternoon, Saturday, uh, most certainly they had Christ's teaching. They knew his parables. They knew all those things that they eventually wrote down. It wasn't those things that sent them out into the world. What sent them out into the world was the resurrection, you see. And also this, and I have a quote here. Just uh, let me read this quote, uh, which uh, points to the, just uh, what a wonderful thing this is. Within 50 days of his death, and what appeared to be the collapse of his cause, the city of Jerusalem rang with the cries of the disciples, who with boldness declared God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and they were his witnesses. Craven cowards were changed into courageous confessors. Crude, unlettered fishermen from Galilee became royal heralds of the king. All who saw and heard them knew something had changed their lives. 
Isn't that something? Something had changed their lives. These men were not the same men. That something phenomenal happened that changed them in 50 days. 50 days before they're hiding, aren't they? Afraid that they might be arrested and put to death. Afraid. Cowards. The Bible doesn't try to in any way hide it. They were cowards. They were afraid. They had fled into the dark. And on Friday night and Saturday, they're just nowhere. And they're not the ones who go out to the tomb on Sunday morning. It's the women who go out to the tomb and finish the embalming process. To finish embalming. The, to finish the embalming process. The disciples, uh, no. When the ladies come back, Mary Magdalene comes back and says the tomb is empty. So when they do run out, Peter and John... But uh, before that, they're, they're uh, hiding there in the upper room. So what was it that changed them? It sent them out. It was the resurrection. This was really, really real. And so we stress this, you know, in the world of that time and in the scriptures, which is stressed, immortality of the soul or resurrection of the body? If you come into the New Testament, what is stressed there? Resurrection of the body or immortality of the soul? Resurrection is stressed, isn't it? Yes. Resurrection. The Greeks believed in immortality of soul. They did not believe in the resurrection. They really questioned that, doubted that. That's why the great chapter in the Bible on the resurrection is Corinth, because that's where questions about this all arose. So Christ Jesus rose. Now today we're going to continue looking at the steps of exaltation. Remember that? And I had steps here on the board, and I said the first step was what? Remember I put those steps on the board last week? The first step was descended. descended into hell. The next step was arose again from the dead. The next step was ascended into heaven. huh? And the next step was sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And the next step was she'll come again to judge the quick and the dead. And so you can take the Apostles' Creed and put those all those different... Um, Words there on steps, you know, he was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, died, was crucified, died, and buried, and so on. And then going back up, he is, um, descends into hell, arose again from the dead, and now ascends into heaven. And we're going to study those three today, ascends into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and shall come again to judge the quick and the dead. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to... Uh, look at ascension at the ascension and I want you to look in your Bibles on at Acts chapter 1 verse 6 look at Acts chapter 1 verse 6 let's see exactly where that is Acts chapter 1 verse 6 is on page 909 909 So if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6. In fact, we'll start at verse 1. Start reading down at verse 1. Would you follow, follow along with me? In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Who wrote the book of Acts? What was the first book that, what's the first book he's referring to? Luke. Yes, Luke wrote the book of Acts, I mean the book of Luke, of course, and now this is a continuation. Now he's going to tell what happened after the resurrection. <clears throat> By the way, anyone see the movie yesterday? I guess it came out for the first time yesterday, the movie uh, on the Apostle Paul. Did you see it? Anybody see that? It's in the theaters. It started yesterday. I just read a thing about, uh, I forget how many theaters it was. But it was uh, the Kansas City paper had a very good write-up on it. It's about the last days of the Apostle Paul and uh, Luke and Paul. Uh, Paul and Luke are featured in that. And Luke is uh, played by the man who played Jesus in The Passion, in the story of The Passion. So um, good reviews on it so far. And by the way, it was also uh, in the, uh, read that in the paper that um, I can only imagine now... <laughs> is really doing phenomenal. The movie, I can only imagine uh, this movie. Huh? Didn't watch it yesterday. You went to see it yesterday? Okay. Where did you see it? St. Joe or Kansas City? 
Huh? Okay, yeah. And uh, uh, originally, when they made that movie, it cost $7 million, and they were hoping to uh, break even on it. And as of yesterday, or the, uh, the, the statistics from yesterday, they have now taken in $38 million, and, and it's just phenomenal. And they thought maybe it'd run a, maybe two or three days and then be done, but now it's still running, and still people are coming to see it, and so on and so forth. So it's quite a testimony. Did you like it? It's quite a testimony, isn't it, of what uh, Christ can do in the lives of people. Is well, that the title of the fall movie, I Can Only Imagine? I Can Only Imagine, that's a, yes. That's a song, you know, and uh, it's about the writer of that song, I guess, and so on. But this one on the Apostle Paul is also getting good reviews, and let's hope people also go to see that because it's supposed to be very, uh, very good. Anyway. What do you say the title of the Apostle Paul one? Mm -hmm. What's the name I think of that it, one? I think it's, huh? I think it's just Paul, Paul or something like that, huh? I think it's Paul the Apostle. Paul the yes, Paul the Apostle. That's it, Paul the Apostle. Yeah. Well, back to this. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. In other words. His first book ends with the ascension. Not much about it, but just ends mentioning that. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So here he mentions, of course, that the resurrection and also that uh, he has appeared many times uh, to the disciples uh, to prove that he truly is alive. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, so uh, they're all in Jerusalem. They're waiting there for a very big <coughs> promise to be fulfilled. Jesus uh, gives them that promise in the upper room before he dies, and then he repeats that promise, of course, during those 40 days. And now they are together waiting for that promise. But this happens now. So verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. Hmm. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. It tells you the names of the disciples and so on who were there. But look at this. It's on this particular day now, they are, and how many days after Easter is it or after the resurrection? Forty days. Forty days later after the resurrection, this all takes place. And they are on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus leads them out there. The disciples are they are still struggling with this, though. They're still wondering whether he's going to establish some kind of kingdom here on earth. And uh, that's why they ask this question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he just kind of passes over that. He's not going to get into that or, uh, with them. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Uh, don't be concerned about this. He said, let's just leave that alone. Leave that, into the hand, leave that in the hands of the Father. What I want you to be concerned about, this is verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria 
and to the end of the earth. Now, that's very significant because you see, what he's saying is, I don't want you to be sitting around speculating about uh, these kind of things about which you've just asked. I want you to be out in the world witnessing for me. And he says, I want you to start right here in Jerusalem, and then I want you to go to Judea, the area around, and then I want you to go to Samaria, and then finally I want you to go out to the whole world. And that's very significant that he's talking about the world in a, pe in a day in which people were not talking about the world. But they are to start right where they are. And that's very significant, you see. He says, I, he doesn't say, I want you to start in Rome. I don't want you to start in Athens. I want you to start right here. And what's significant about that, that is this, that if there was any kind of way that they could have denied the resurrection... They would have, you see. He's going to, they're going to start right in the place where the enemies are, see? They're going to start in the place where the Pharisees are trying to discredit the resurrection. They're going to start in a place which is really going to add to the authenticity of their witness. See, because if there was any kind of evidence that it was not true, that would have been thrown up right away. Now, what they try to do is get them to quit preaching this, and they're going to throw them in jail, and you'll see that in the book of Acts, you see, for preaching this. And all they can do is say, quit preaching this in the streets. They have no way to discredit what they're saying. There's no way they can deny what they're saying. They're preaching the resurrection. They say, you keep preaching this, we're going to throw you in jail. And they did. They arrested them and all kinds of things, trying to stop it. But that's where they're to start, right there in Jerusalem. And then they're going to Judea, then Samaria, and then to the world. And the book of Acts is built on this, you see, as you read through the book of Acts, you first see them working here, then you see them going into Judea, then you see them going into Samaria, and finally you see them going out into the world as they knew the world in that day. You see them going into Greece and finally ending up in Rome. And when they get to Rome, the capital, you know, of, of the empire, uh, that's where Acts ends and Paul is in prison there. But that's, that's what he says to them. I want you to be my witnesses out into the world. He calls them, what's he called them? He doesn't call them elders. He doesn't call these men his board of directors. He doesn't call them the founders of a new religion. Anything like this. What does he call them? Huh? Apostles. What are apostles? Messengers. No. Yes, they're messengers, of course, yes. But the word apostle means sent, sent. Apostle means sent. Apostello is the Greek word for send. So he calls his, these men the sent ones. And that tells them their mission. That tells them what they're all about. And calls them, you know, on the Sea of Galilee. And he says, I'm, and even there they are called apostles. But they are the original sent ones. But their whole task is to go out and witness, and he sends them out at this point, out into the world. But, look what it says, now, also this, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazed into heaven, behold, two men stood by them, here you got angels again, and this is just really something, the angel said, men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the heaven? Boy, that's kind of a strange word to say, isn't it? What would you would expect? My goodness, they've just seen their Lord ascend and, and go out in a cloud, take him away, and they're just standing there transfixed by this wondrous thing they've just seen. And here these guys come along, the angels, and say, what are you guys looking at? Why do you just stand here looking up like that? It's kind of a little zinger, isn't it? Yeah, but... Uh, Anyway, they're standing there looking. And then listen to what the angel says. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, it's very important to note. This Jesus, when he comes back, is going to come in this way. You're going to see him. Everyone's going to see him. That's what it, what it is saying when he comes back. Now, think of this. For 40 days, he has been appearing and disappearing. He'll be with the disciples in the upper room, and then he'll be gone. Or he's out on the seashore, and then he'll be gone. So he has been appearing and disappearing for 40 days. Now the question comes, why didn't he simply disappear again? Why this 
great demonstration connected with his ascension into heaven. Why? Now does he go up and they see him go and the cloud comes and takes him away and so on. Why this great demonstration? Well, it goes along with what the angel says. When you see him again, you'll be coming and everyone will see him. So you can approach this by asking this question. How do you know, for instance, when Oral Roberts, Oral Roberts here a few years ago comes on television on a Sunday morning and he says, Jesus appeared to me last night. He was 90 feet tall. And he told me to announce to all of you listening to my voice this morning to send to me 200 and I think it was $93 so that I can complete this building here at Oral Roberts University. Now, how do you know that's not true? How do you know that Jesus did not appear to him? Because that's what Jesus is saying. That's what the disciples are. That's what the angels here are saying. Jesus is not going to be flitting around this world. You know, when people say, well, he appeared to me and so on and so forth. You know, that's not true. Because right here is what the scripture says. He's, you're not going to see him on this earth until he comes back and everyone sees him. So, when... Joseph Smith says that Jesus appeared to him in the Catskill Mountains. That becomes the foundation of the Mormon church. Here's the scripture that says that, no, that's not so, because this is what the angels said. So all of this demonstration, this going up, is to say, you know, he has gone back. Now, the cloud is not just any old cloud. You see that cloud all the way through the scriptures, don't you? You see that cloud all the way back at, uh, at uh, the time of Moses leading the children of Israel through the through wilderness or through the desert. You see that cloud at the dedication of the temple. You see that cloud coming down whenever Moses meets the Lord in the tent outside the tabernacle. You see that cloud, like I said, when the dedication of the temple. You see that cloud, of course, when Jesus is transfigured. You see that cloud at his baptism. So that cloud is evidence, and that's the, that's the sign of the presence of God. And so when the cloud comes and takes him away, that's not simply to blot him out of sight. That cloud is to say he has ascended back into the presence of his father. He has ascended back into heaven. And the cloud simply uh, takes him out of sight and out of this dimension of living and into eternity back to heaven. But all of that is part of the, uh, of the ascension. Now, in Matthew... Matthew ends with him, also with the ascension, but right before the ascension, but gives a great big promise. And we read this promise, of course, at the very beginning of our class, when he says to the, says to the disciples, and this is his last uh, works too, along with those words about witnessing that I just placed on the board, you know, also is the great commission at the end of Matthew, where he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so you put those together too now. He ascends into heaven and yet at the same time he sends to the, says to the disciples, I'm going to be with you as you carry out the task that I am giving you. See, So he sends them out into the world. He says, I'm going but I'm staying with you to help you carry out this great task that I have given you. And so while he sends them out from, all of the, from Jerusalem and so on and so forth, he has promised that he's going to be with you, with them and see them all the way. Well, the disciples then come back to Jerusalem and um, my, they are filled with joy as they come back and you see them in the upper room and they are praying and they are waiting for the fulfillment of the coming of the Spirit. All of that is in chapter 1 of Acts and then chapter 2. That's the story of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, which happens 10 days after the ascension. So look at the time span, see? Here's the resurrection, 40 days after that, the ascension into heaven, 10 days after that, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and Pentecost. So that's how that all comes together. Ascension Day in the early church was a very big day. That was a big day that was celebrated. We still have an Ascension Day service here. It's always 30 on a Thursday. It'll be, uh, I think, what, what is it now this year? Around 
the 14th of May or something like this, but we still have Thursday night Ascension Day services. Lots of churches don't have that anymore. But in the early church, that was a very big day. You see, the three big festivals in the early church were Easter, Resurrection, and Ascension, and Pentecost. Those were the ones that were celebrated. Christmas was not celebrated until about the 300s. And in the 300s, and they start celebrating Christmas, and that begets, gets to be a bigger holiday. And now in today's world, of course, with the uh, business world and all the commercialism and so on and so forth, connected with Christmas, that is the big holiday, I guess you'd say. Easter, not nearly as big. And, and Ascension, nothing, of course. You never got an Ascension Day card, did you? No. <laughs> no. So Ascension just comes and goes, and... And uh, no one even knows that it is Ascension, except here at Church Trinity we do celebrate Ascension Day um, because it is a big day in the, in the, it was a big day and is a big day in the life of our Lord Christ. He ascends back into heaven from which he had come. And what we talk about on that day, of course, is that he's going back to heaven. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the other, the other big thing is now he's gone and we have this tremendous task of taking the world, taking uh, the gospel out into the world. And so Ascension Day becomes kind of a mission festival too. And we remind ourselves, what are we all about? And what is the church all about? And what the congregations are all about? And so on. Anyway, do you have any questions about that? About the ascension of our Lord Christ into heaven? How, how those all come together. Next Sunday, of course, we celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Christ, and uh, like I said, 40 days after that, we will celebrate Ascension Day. Yeah. An unusual farewell. I'm leaving, but I'm, I'm not leaving. Well, the next thing that comes is then what? Ascended into heaven. Does what? Sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. What does that mean? Does that mean that God has a right hand and Jesus is sitting on a chair beside him on his right side? What does that mean? Sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's an idiom. What's an idiom? You girls back there in English class, do you know what an idiom is? An idiom is a little phrase that doesn't mean what it says. Huh? Our language is full of idioms. Our English language is full of idioms. In other words, we say things that doesn't mean at all what it says. So if I say that Justin here goes to bed with the chickens, what have I said? Does, does Justin go to bed with the chickens? Hmm? What have I said when I say that? He goes to bed early. Right, he goes to bed early. Or I say, um, keep your shirt on. What am I saying? Calm down. Calm down. Don't get excited. Yeah. So we have all kinds of it. Hold your horses. It's yeah. cats and dogs. Yeah. It's raining cats and dogs. <laughs> yes. So we have all kinds of idioms and in our language. huh? And uh, this is what says, what... Uh, this is idiom two. Idioms, because that makes our language very complicated. And when we had, a, we had our foster boy, Su Win, that we got from uh, Vietnam, he was one of the boat kids, and uh, he was with us two or three years. And Su Win would always, and he, he could hardly speak English, you know, when he came to us. And he'd come to us with these idioms and say, what mean? He couldn't say, uh, th, he couldn't, uh, that sound he couldn't make, and so he'd come to me and he'd say, fodder. He'd say, fodder? What mean this? <laughs> you know? And he'd ask about some, something that he'd heard. I, I remember he was working to get a driver's license and, and uh, reading the book on driver's license, and he came to me and he said, what mean this? Do not drive on shoulder. You know? What does that mean? Yeah, so that's an idiom too. I see all of those kind of things. Well, it's very difficult. Well, that's what this is. Sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty is simply an idiom which says he is king of kings and lord of lords. All power is his. All power is his. He's the ruler 
of all things. He is the ruler over this universe. He is the ruler over his church. He is the ruler over heaven, that he is king of kings and lord of lords. So I want you to look at Ephesians 1.19, and this is where this language comes from. It's in the creed. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, and that is on page 976. 976. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. Let's go back to verse 15, okay? Verse 15. Start at verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the, heaven, in, in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And now these are, this explains what that means. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in, that, in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now all of that last writing there is what sits at the right hand of God the Father says sits at the right hand of God the Father simply is a phrase, a short phrase to tell you all of those things. Finally, what that means is this, that he is afar above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. That finally, every name that you can name, whether it be president or czar or king or whatever name of authority and power that you can name as the highest here on earth, finally, he is over all of that. He is the one who really is in control of history. He is the one who determines how things go and so on and so forth. So far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and above every name that is named, he finally is king of kings and lord of lords. Not only in this age, not only right now here in history, but also in the one to come. He's going to rule in eternity. And that's referring to heaven and so on. And he put all things under his feet. He is king and he is lord and gave him as head over all things to the church. Finally, he rules all things for the sake of his church, that it may carry out the work which God has given it, which is his body, the church is, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, Christ Jesus ascends into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And um, his kingdom is a kingdom that's going to rule forever, I mean, it lasts forever, and he's going to rule over it forever. I mentioned this before, you know, Hitler established a kingdom, and he called it the Third Reich, and he says it's going to last for a thousand years, and it lasted about 10, 12, 13 years, and then it was finished. Christ established a kingdom, and it's going to continue all through eternity. And that's what this is saying here. Huh? Now, he continues to rule over all things for the sake of his church. Now, mo most certainly the church suffers and there is persecution and Christians are killed and all of these kind of things. But finally, in all and through all, he's still at work and he's uh, still uh, bringing about the fulfillment of his father's will, the growth of his kingdom and all of these kind of things. Huh? Yeah. Look what he's doing now. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, and that is on page 1003, 1003, Hebrews 4, 14.
Hebrews 4.14. Got it? 1003. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. That's referring to what? When it says he passed through the heavens, that's what we just talked about. huh? That's the ascension. You see, that's the ascension. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in, to help in time of need. So we go to him who is our intercessor. He prays for us, you see. And he knows what we're experiencing because he has been here. So that's, what, that's the point that is being made. Let us hold fast to our confession. Let's not back down at all, confessing him as Lord and Savior. We have a high priest who, who knows our weaknesses, um, was tempted just like we are, yet without sin he overcame all. But uh, we can go to him and he knows what we're going through and he knows what we're talking about and, and he can, we can receive from him the help that we need and we know he understands and all of those kind of things. But he is interceding for us right now, you see. So we can approach him with boldness. We can approach him with boldness. Here's another place where it talks about his interceding for us and that's in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. You know, when we come to the Lord and we say, we pray in the name of Jesus... This is what we're talking about. But look now at Romans chapter 8, will you please? Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Verse 34. To have it on page 945. 945. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at, and here you have it again, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. It is because of this passage also that we know that our Lord Christ is interceding for us. We don't have to go to Mary, you see. In the Roman Catholic Church, we talked about that uh, here uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, is all of these prayers to Mary that somehow she is able to intercede for us better than our going to Jesus alone. In the scripture, there's nothing like that at all. In fact, it talks about Jesus interceding for us. And here is one of the places. You see, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. And he's watching over, he's taking care of, and this is the confidence that comes out in these passages right here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our confidence is in him. He has gone on ahead of us into heaven, ascended, and he's there praying for us by, uh, as he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So just think of this now, what great comfort there is in this. I have this, I have my Savior in heaven who intercedes for me. I have the promise of his presence. He's going to see me through whatever may happen in my life. Huh? That's the confidence that we live with. That's the promise that we live with, that he is at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. All things finally under his control. He is indeed King of kings and Lord of Lords. Any questions or thoughts connected with that? Sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. When you say that in the creed, the creed is simply screaming at you that Jesus Christ is here. You know, he's not off distance someplace. Christ Jesus is here with me now. He is interceding for me, but he's always present with me. 
He is at my side. He's in every relationship that is in my life. He's always there at my side. He is always there with me. So that's a great comfort. And that I have, think of this. He's King of Kings and He's Lord of Lords. He is in control of the universe. And yet I have direct access to Him. Think of that. You can talk in prayer, you can talk to the one who's in control of the universe. Now you can't, you know, you can't get on the phone and you can't even get a doctor on the phone today, you see, who, <laughs> directly, who can you talk to directly? You see, you certainly can't call the President of the United States on the phone and say, here, I want to talk to you, or a senator or anybody else, you see, you have to, my goodness, that's impossible, but you can go to that one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You can go directly to him and you can talk to him and you can bring the woes of your heart to him, the thanksgiving of your heart to him. What a, what a wonderful, beautiful blessing that we have this Savior who is close by, whom we can go to any time and always. Huh? So you can wake up in the middle of the night and talk to him. That's what you do. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep, you talk to him. Isn't that the way you handle that? Don't worry about this or that. You see, just talk to him about whatever it might be that would come into your heart and into your mind. Okay? So, he ascends into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And then what? <coughs> He's going to come back to do what? Judge the living and the dead. Which says what? This world is going to come to an end. Do you believe that? That this world is going to come to an end? Hmm? Do you believe that? Yeah. Not all religions do, of course, you know. The Christian faith, of course, and the Bible, of course, says that there was a beginning and there will be an end. That kind of is how you would diagram history, I guess you would say. Eastern religions say, no, what? There is going to be no end. Time is just repeating itself. And um, same thing is happening over and over again. Reincarnation, we're coming into existence and out of existence. And things are simply going in a cycle, but it goes on and on and on. But that's not the scriptures. The scripture says, of course, that there was a time when there was simply God. And there will be a time when God brings all things to an end and then reestablishes so that it will be like it was in the beginning before God brought anything into existence at all. But there was only a time. There was a time, of course, when there was only what? God. And there's no way to understand that, of course. Our minds simply cannot understand eternity, cannot understand. You know, our minds are made to, to comprehend so much and go so far in understanding, and, it, and they stop. And that's part of our creation, isn't it? So asking the question, you know, who made God, there's no answer to that. That's simply beyond our comprehension or imagination. Yet that's one of the first questions that come to mind, huh? I remember a few years ago. The teacher, I forget which kindergarten teacher it was, but asked me to come over one day because the kids had some questions they wanted to ask the pastor. And so, now think of this. This is one little kid who's five years old, and he raises his hand, and he said, I said, what is your question? And he said, who made God? I said, well, that's a tremendous question for a five-year-old who's thinking that well already and wants to know who made God and I said I don't know the answer <laughs> that's beyond us all that's not only beyond a five year old that's beyond any and all of us you see but there was a time when there was not and then God by his word brought all things into existence and that of course is just incomprehensible but there is going to be an end and he's going to reestablish, and the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth that is not infected by sin. It talks about resurrection, all of these things. That finally God's great plan of life is not going to be defeated or thwarted. He's going to reestablish. And that's what the end of the world 
is all about. Now, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. That's on page 829. 829. Yes, 829 is where we're going to be looking. Matthew 24, 829. This is during Holy Week. This is Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus in the temple area. On Monday, he has driven out the money changers and the sellers of animals from the temple. On Sunday, of course, that's today. Palm Sunday, he rides into the city with that great exuberant welcome. On Monday, he is back in the, goes back, back out to Bethany on Sunday night. Monday, he's back in Jerusalem, back at the temple, and that's when he drives out the money changers and the sellers of animals and says this, you've made God's house into a place of business and, and uh, it's supposed to be a place of prayer and he drives all those out. Tuesday he's back there again and teaching in the temple area about different things and then comes this chapter and 24 and look at the very first verse there. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. And it was a beautiful, beautiful structure. One of the most beautiful in the world at that time. But he answered, and, he, and they call his attention. And they're saying, you know, boy, this, isn't this something, this, this temple? Isn't it a beautiful place? And he's saying, yes. But you see all of these, do you not? Truly I say to you. There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Then they leave the temple area, leave Jerusalem, go up on the Mount of Olives, and they are sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking down upon the city now. And the disciples come to him with a question about what he has just said. They're perplexed. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. They're all by themselves now. No one's around. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. Now that's significant that he begins this teaching about the end of the world by saying, don't let anyone lead you astray on this. Now, he never said anything like that when he taught about prayer. He didn't say anything like that when he talked about money and giving and stewardship. He didn't say anything like that about in lots of things. This is the first teaching about which he says that. Now, what I'm going to teach you, uh, be careful that uh, no one leads you astray on this particular point because many are going to come with all kinds of ideas about this. And watch out for them, because they're going to mislead many, many people when it comes to this particular teaching. And it has been so down through history. And I have books upstairs that indicate this. You know, beginning already in the year 1000, there were those who came and said, this is the end of the world. It has to be the end of the world now, because this is happening, this is happening, this has to be the end of the world. And of course it was not, but it seems like there's almost every generation since then has had that person who has come predicting the end of the world. At the time of Martin Luther, of course, there was a man who came along and said the world is going to end on such and such a day. And he even said it was going to end again by a flood, which didn't make any sense because, of course, that's in the Old Testament, the rainbow and all those kind of things. But he gained followers. He gained followers, and, and uh, they were preparing for the end of the world and, and uh, uh, making boats and so on and so forth so that they wouldn't be drowned with all everybody else. Well, it came, that day came, of course, and it did rain that day, but uh, it wasn't the end of the world. And then one of the, one, two, this was a very strange one. This was in England during the 1700s, the early 1700s. There was a lady there who said that God had appeared to her and uh, told her that she was going to give birth to the Christ child. 
And when she gave birth to him, she would raise him uh, to, to adulthood, and then he would establish a kingdom, which would be here on earth, and that would be the golden age and so on, and everything would be peace and wonderful and, and this and that. And she became, uh, began to show all the signs of pregnancy. Now, she was a maiden lady, and she was not married, and she began to show all the signs of pregnancy. And everybody began to wonder, you know, maybe this is true. And so they set her up in a very nice apartment. They said this time when he is born into this world, uh, he's not going to be born in a stable. and He's going to be born like a, like a royal prince should be born king. And uh, so they had a golden bassinet and a golden crib and, a crib and all those kind of things. And again, she had all kinds of followers. There were people who believed her and, and followed her thinking. And that day came when she was to, uh, that day came and she went, began to go into labor pains, like she was going to have a baby. And people were celebrating and praising God and all these kind of things. And then she died in what appeared to be having a baby. Only there was no baby. There was no baby. And psychiatrists now look back and they call that, what they call that this hysterical pregnancy that a woman can so desire to have a child that all the signs of pregnancy given, begin to appear as if she were going to have a child, but there's no child there. And so they say evidently that's what was happening there. Well, her followers, of course, disappeared or dis, uh, disbanded. Well, down through uh, the century, like I said, down through the years, there's been all these kind of people who have appeared and said there's going to be the end of the world at such and such a time. And uh, for instance, in America, we've had them all here in America too. A man by the name of William Miller in the year, uh, in the 19, or 1840s, uh, came on the scene. He was originally a Baptist man, and uh, he uh, began to... Uh, predict the end of the world. And he was studying scripture and getting special messages from the Lord and so on. And he said the end of the world is going to come on March the 21st, 1843. And that will be the day. And so he again gained followers and they uh, came out onto the hills of the Catskill Mountains on that day and they dressed in white robes waiting for the Lord to come and take them to heaven. And of course he did not. And then William Miller went back to his uh, Bible and back to Revelation and back to studying and so forth. And he came back and he said, well, I miscalculated. It's going to be in 1844, uh, March of 21st, 1844. And again, some of his followers left, but then a lot of them stayed with him. And uh, But that day came and again, there was no, uh, no Jesus returning. Um, he continued to teach uh, certain things and certain doctrines and interpreted the, the Old Testament for the people who followed him. And his followers at that time were called Millerites. And he really went into the Old Testament and the Old Testament laws and said, this is what must be done and this is what we must do and, and so on. And, and, and special revelations from God and all these kind of things. And of course, like all, he eventually died. His followers stayed together, though, and many of them began to, uh, well, stay together and, and uh, form congregations. Today, they are known as the Seventh-day Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventists. They started from this man, William Miller, in the 1840s. And uh, lots of Old Testament laws, the dietary laws of the Old Testament, of course, very rigid about you have to worship on Saturday, and if you don't worship on Saturday, you're headed for hell because you're really breaking God's commandment. And uh, my, and we have seven Adventists here in town, and, and uh, very legalistic in lots of different ways. But, and one called me on the phone a while back, well, this is a couple years ago. I put on, this, on the uh, billboard out here in front, our, our sign out in front, Sunday is still the Sabbath. And I had a seven-day Adventist call me on the phone and say, it is not the Sabbath, Saturday is the Sabbath. And then she also told me that, when I went to hell because I'm going to hell because I'm misleading people into believing that you can worship on Sunday and you really can't. And she said, then your, your plight in hell is going to be worse than your followers, the members of your church, because uh, you have led them to believe that, you see. So she was quite... Uh, so what, quite did you say? what did you say to her? I just said, thank you. I don't know. I don't know what I said anymore. But I just said, well... 
I don't know. I don't know how I answered, but I just said something nice to her and then said, I, I get the will in this conversation. Yeah. Anyway, that's William Miller. And that was in the 1840s, right in that area, and a little bit later. In the 1870s, then another man came on the scene, and his name was Charles Russell. And he also was on the East Coast, and he began going up and down the East Coast, and he was preaching, too, that the world is going to end only this time in 1914. He says 1914, he has the date picked and all these kind of things. And he has all these signs about why this is going to happen. He, too, has studied the book of Revelation, come up with this uh, idea about the end of the world. And he draws large crowds of people all up and down the coast come to hear him, you know, in Boston, New York, and Baltimore, and all those places. And 1914, course, comes, and there is no uh, end of the world either. And his followers are called Russellites. They stay together. And uh, um, they also begin to publish a little magazine, which they distribute to people, and it's called The Watchtower. And that, of course, is the beginning of that group, which we call the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses. Witnesses. Yeah, that's where they all started was back then with uh, Charles Russell, and they, called, they were called Russellites for a while until finally he died, and, and he, you know, uh, predicted the end of the world in 1914, and then sometime later, I think, in 1918, and so on and so forth, of course, it never came about, but uh, he then also was uh, one of those who predicted the end of the world, and like, like I said, in our own time, 1984 was a big year. It was supposed to end in 1984. And a man by the name of Hal Lindsey wrote a book, and I don't know whether you got the book, I read it way back then, called The Late Great Planet Earth. The Late Great Planet Earth. And he sold millions of copies of that book, and the world was to end in 1984. Well, of course, we're still here now. <laughs> and, uh, but that's coming, and you hear it. Frequently, you hear it frequently, you know, people coming along and say, well, the world is going to end at such and such a day, and it is predicted to end in such and such a day. Um, someone uh, bought a little book here a while back, well, I don't know, this couple, three years ago, and left it on my desk, and I don't know where they got it, but th this was predicting the end of the world on a certain day in that year, like in October that year, the world was supposed to end, and and uh, this little book had a price on it, $2, and I threw it away eventually. And, uh, but anyway, the world was supposed to end on this particular day on, uh, in this October this year. And, um, and also the reasons why it was going to end on that day. Now, what was significant about that is I kind of just passed it off and forgot it, you know, threw it away. But then on that day, the day after that day, and I'd forgotten about it by that time, the day after that day in the Kansas City paper, here was a little article back on one of the back pages about this, about a man selling a little book all across America, and lots of copies had been sold, telling about the end of the world on this particular day. He spent that day in his yacht off the coast of Florida, <laughs> which tells you something, too. You see, it was a big sham and put on kind of thing, but sold enough of those books, I guess, to at least get himself a little boat or yacht or whatever he had. But you hear about that every once in a while, don't you, that the world is going to end at this particular time. On the news here, I remember hearing a while back that... Uh, uh, some families down in Arkansas had taken their children out of school and, and uh, truant officers were out there getting these kids back into school because this little sect believed that the world was going to end on such and such a day here just in a few weeks and there was no use the kids going to school, just take them out because we're just waiting for Jesus to come back and, and, uh, and uh, bring everything to an end. Well, when Jesus now says all of these things, about the end of the world, the first thing he says then is watch out that no one misleads you in this whole teaching. Well, we are ready to begin again. And um, emphasizing that there, like Jesus warned, there would be lots of folks who would come along saying the world is going to end at such and such a time. <clears throat> In fact, we'll be looking at a passage here that I'll, well, I'll explain that when we get there. But uh, <clears throat> look at this again, would you please? Verse 4 again, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. 
For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. There are even those who have come and said that they are indeed Christ themselves returned. And this man, Moon, did that. He was a Korean, you know, and on the East Coast. And the Moonies, remember the Moonies? And when you go to an airport, they would be selling you flowers and stuff, the Moonies. Well, Moon claimed to be Christ himself returned to this earth. He died here uh, not long ago. And of course, he was in prison for a while for tax evasion, but there was a man who did that and gained lots of followers. That's a strange thing. Remember, he performed those marriages where they would uh, marry people and uh, like hundreds of couples at one time and uh, great marriage ceremonies and so on. Anyway, <clears throat> many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these things are but the beginning of the birth pangs. So here are things that keep happening over and over again. And they have ever since this world has been. But all of those are to simply remind us there is going to be an end. And uh, point us to that and help us to be alert for when that will may be. And then verse 9, And they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. In other words, Christians are going to be persecuted, and that is going to go on and on. And then many will fall away. There will be those who leave the church and fall away and betray one another and even hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. As the end gets closer, these kind of things will happen. And because <clears throat> lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout all the whole world as testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now... All of those other things that have been mentioned down to this point, all of those have simply been a part of history and occur over and over again. The last one, of course, is, is quite unique. And he says, before the end, though, the gospel will be preached all over the world, every nation. The gospel of the kingdom will proclaim, be proclaimed throughout all the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. That is the one passage uh, that is now fulfilled that was not fulfilled 100 years ago. The gospel was not being preached in all the world. But today it is. It, today it is. Uh, in person, in fact. But also, of course, especially through the internet and through television and, and uh, just because of the media. You know, uh, it is now preached all over the world. And uh, so that, that passage is now fulfilled. The, the Kennedy Evangelism Program, EE, Evangelism Explosion, is in all the countries of the world. And uh, Evangelism Explosion, I just got an annual report from them uh, yesterday. And there are Kennedy colors, even in places like uh, the Arabic countries or the Muslim countries. They're underground. They're underground. They're, but they're still working. And the gospel is being preached there. And so... Even in those areas where there's persecution going on, the gospel is still being preached there. Um, and uh, people are coming to know Christ. One of the greatest areas of growth today is in China. You know, my goodness. And in Africa, these places uh, have just phenomenal numbers of people coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior. In Africa, just growing, 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 growing. America, do you know what, you know what the greatest nation is? in terms of having missionaries in Africa is? America is first. America, we have more American missionaries in Africa than any other nation. But the second one is Korea. Now think of that. Before the Korean War, there were uh, only like 2% of Korea was, was Christian. Now it's like 50% of Korea is Christian. That all because of the second, because of the Korean War and the missionaries coming afterwards, the military and all those things. And uh, so a great phenomenal thing. Some of the largest churches in the world are in Korea. You know, uh, there's one church, and I forget the name of it now, in Seoul, which has 700,000 members. Can you imagine that? 
that the church seats like 35,000 people, and they fill that church seven times a day, and uh, 700,000 members. Now, you can have those in the Orient, those kind of churches, because there is only public transportation. You know, in America, you'd have to go to church in a car, but over there, you don't go to church in a car, you go by public transportation, and that's how they can have churches like that, because they don't have to have tons of parking lots. Huh? Where in America, you have to have big parking lots to handle the crowds. I remember being at Bellevue Baptist Church in uh, Memphis, and uh, their church set, seats 7,000 people, but you have to, you can't just go there at the last minute and walk into church because their parking lots are so big. You know, to seat 7,000 people, you have to have a big parking lot. So they have shuttle buses from the back of the parking lot up to the church. So if you get there a little bit late, you're going to have to park way at the back of the parking lot, and then you can't even walk up to, you have to take a shuttle bus from the parking lot up to the church. So when you go to church there, you don't just rush, <coughs> go and rush in at the last five minutes. You, you go ahead of time and so on, and there's directors of traffic and all those kind of things. Well, what, I, what we got off on, the, the, the largest churches, the largest Assembly of God church in the world is in, in Seoul. The largest Presbyterian church is in Seoul, Korea. The largest Methodist church in the world is in Seoul, Korea. So there's all kinds of churches. And of course, we Lutherans are there too. But all the denominations are in Seoul, Korea. But this is a point <clears throat> that Korea has more missionaries in Africa than uh, any other nation except the United States itself. So church is growing and people are coming to know Christ Jesus as Savior because the gospel is being preached in all areas of the world. And, uh, and there's a little magazine comes out about every two months called Marcher, Marcher in the World, Marchers um, in the World Today. And uh, it, it lists uh, the places where people, Christians are being persecuted and stories of what's going on in those places. And yet the church still goes on and the gospel is still being preached and people are still coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So um, the kingdom is growing. And um, and, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing, that there are more Christians in the world today than, of course, ever before. And, uh, are, and they're spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus. But let's go on then. Um, all of these things that he mentions are going to happen are simply to keep us alert to the fact that uh, there is going to be an end of the world. Uh, it's kind of like this, you know, and maybe you've heard this story before, but uh, death comes to uh, uh, comes to uh, claim a man, and death comes walking up to his door, and the man opens the door and says, here I am, I'm going to take you now. And the man is only uh, 30 years old, and, and the man says, my goodness, you didn't give me any warning that you were coming. This isn't fair that you just come at this point, just suddenly break in on me and, and say that you're going to take me. Surely... It would be more fair if you gave me some, some warning that you're coming. And death says, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll warn you the next time before I come. And uh, so time goes on and time goes on and time goes on. And finally the man's about 70 years old now and here death knocks on his door again. He says, I'm come for you. And the man says, you didn't warn me yet. You did, I didn't get any warnings from you that you were coming. And, um, and death says, oh, yes, I've been warning you all along. He said, I look at the color of your hair, and uh, mentions a whole bunch of things, which of course come with age. And he said, all of those were warnings that there is an end. And we know that, don't we? You know, as we go through life, uh, we get gray hair, and we lose our teeth and our hearing, or we get cataracts and all kinds of things like this, don't they? And all of those things are simply saying to us what? There is going to be such a thing as death, and it is going to come. When we, when, we do not know, but it is coming, and the certainty of it uh, is, is so. It's going to come. Well, so that it is here, too, that uh, all of these things, well, you could say, well, there's famines, and there's earthquakes, and there's wars, and rumors of wars, and that's been going on all along. Yet, And, and through all of that, God is saying, this world is not it. There is something yet to be, and uh, this world is going to come to an end. Now, when that will be, of course... There is no way to tell that. We just have to be alert and on the watch for that. Look at a passage like, like Mark 13, 32. We mentioned that there's these people who are predicting the end of the world all the time, but you look at Mark 13, 32. Mark 13, 32. Let's see when that will be. That's on page 
850, 850, 13, 32. Do you have it? Yes, 850. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now that's Mark 13, 32. Only the Father knows. Now I mention that because this happened, and I can still remember when it happened. It happened in 1988, in the fall of 1988. And why I remember is because we had just finished the new buildings, and we didn't have telephones in the buildings yet. We had just finished the new building. But I'm, I'm having a meeting over in the new school building that fall. I don't remember exactly what day. But all of a sudden, outside the door, here's one of our members who had graduated from our school and, and moved away to St. Joe. And I hadn't seen him for a while. And here he is standing outside the door of, this, of the room over there where we're having this meeting. The motions for me to come out. So I go out, go out in the hall and he said, I've been trying to get you on the phone. I can't get you on the phone. So I decided I need to come down and just find you and ask you this question. And he said, my wife came home from work today. And she, by the way, goes to another church. They didn't go to the same church. She went to another church in St. Joe. And he went to our Lutheran church. And um, she came home today and said, uh, she's quitting work. And she's quitting work because at their church, the pastor is saying the world's going to end now here in about six weeks. So I had a date all set and so on and so forth. And so she came home today and said, you know, we, and said, pastor said that we're going to, the world's going to end and has all these reasons. And she said, there's no use working anymore. And, and so I'm going to quit my job. And so he says, I know there's that passage in the Bible that says no one knows the day or the time, but I can't, I don't know where it is anymore. I can't find it. So he drives all the way down here to find me. Me and I said, well, I don't know the exact verse, but I know it's in Mark 13. And so he said, good, and he left. And then later I heard that he convinced his wife not to quit, not to quit to work. But see, that's, that's in the world, and that's still around. But there's a passage now. Now look at 2 Peter 3.10. 2 Peter 3.10. This is about uh, the end when it does come. So 2 Peter... 310, 2 Peter 310. This is on page 1019. 1019. 1019, chapter 3, verse 10. Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Hmm. That's a picture then of the end of the world. And it's going to come very suddenly. And everything is going to just pass away in a cataclysmic <coughs> way. Be something. You know, like it's going to come like a thief. You don't expect a thief. And so you, you don't know when this will be. It will come like a thief, but uh, it will be. And the heavens will pass away with a roar and everything is going to be dissolved and melt and so on. You know, used to wonder how that would be, that everything is simply going to be melted, so to speak. The heat is going to be so big that it's just going to melt and dissolve things. Until 9-11, and then suddenly that begins to make some sense. When you saw those towers just melting and just coming down. And then you heard on the television the, the roar that went with that. The roar that was there as all those buildings just dissolved and came down. And what came to mind was that's a picture of the end, you see. That's what it's talking about. It says that all these, it's just everything is going to just dissolve and there'll be a huge roar. And... Uh, so reading that now, what I think of, when I read that now, I think of that, those pictures from 9-11, just those buildings melting away. Goodness, it was something, as you well know. But that's there. Then look back at um, 1 Peter chapter 4. Just look back a page. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Now, Peter can write this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. 
Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality and so on. Talks about living the Christian life because the end is near. Now, they could write that, see, because of what had happened. In the Old Testament, when it talks about the end of the world, and it talks about the end of the world in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament person knows it's not going to happen in his time because the Messiah has not come. See, the Messiah first must come, and then the end of the world will come. So there's, in between the end of the world and the Old Testament person, there is the coming of the Messiah. See? But now the Messiah has come. So the next big thing is the end of the world. And so Peter and the rest of them can talk that way, and they can say the end of all things is at hand. It's at hand. There, there's The Messiah has come. Now the next big thing to happen is for him to come back in the end of the world. And so that's how you look at those passages then. Uh, and what Paul writes then too, see, this is the next big thing. The end of the world is going to come, and it is going to come at some time in which we do not expect it to come. But look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 then. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Please look at that. That's on page 1028, 1028. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. See, that goes along with what the angel said at uh, ascension. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. That when he comes back, everyone is going to know that he is coming back and everyone will see him. How that again is possible, I don't know, but because this world is round and so on, I don't know how that will be. But I know God takes care of things and with all things God are possible. All things with God are possible, so I know that he's going to be taking care of that, see. But he's going to come back very suddenly and then will come the judgment. There are those churches that believe in what is called the... Uh, the uh, rapture, we don't believe that. You know, the churches say that there's going to be a rapture, everyone's going to be taken up, and Christ is going to come back, and he's going to rule on earth for a thousand years. Um, that's not really in Scripture, that all of these other passages point out the fact that he's coming back, then that will be the end, and so on. And one of the big passages of, for that is Revelation, or is uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. Please look at this chapter, and this is on page 987, 987. When it comes to talking about the end of the world, we, we strict to the, strictly stay in the epistles where everything is quite plain and quite, quite clear. We do not go to the picture language of the Revelation because there are so many pictures there into which you can read lots and that's what happens so often today. People will go to the book of Revelation, they'll find all kinds of things which could not have had any meaning at all to the ones who first heard that. What Revelation points out is this, that Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. There is going to be an end. He is going to be, trium he is going to be triumphant. Uh, life is going to continue. It's going to be a great and wonderful uh, promise that God has for us in heaven, all of those kind of things. But then when you get all these little details about this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and, and so on and so forth, that is reading into that uh, lots and lots of things that are not there. But look at this. This is very plain, and this is very clear. And this is 987 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And uh, this is the passage, and you've heard me say this before, but again, that we read as the epistle lesson for our funerals. And so every time you've been to a Lutheran funeral here, you've heard this passage read. But it goes this way. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven 
with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we be always with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Those words are very plain and very clear. The Christ is going to come back. It's going to be in a twinkling of an eye, which means a blink of an eye. And so everything is going to be going along just quite well. And then all of a sudden, like that, the blink of an eye, the end of the world will be here. Christ will be here. There will be resurrection. His voice will sound across the world. Resurrection will take place. Those who have been his own people and believed in him will be with him in heaven. Those who have not, of course, will be separated from him, and that is called hell. But all of that is uh, at the end of the world or toward, or is about the end of the world. So when it's, so how do those Christians look at all of that? Jesus said this, that uh, lift up your heads because when it does come, that means your redemption and your salvation. Not anything to be afraid of. We have God as our Father, and that we don't have to be afraid of it. The world is going to end for all of us. It will either end in death now, or it will end with our Lord Christ coming back. Either way, of course, what we are assured of is don't be afraid of anything because uh, we have a great promise. We have a great Savior. We have a great heaven ready for us and all of those kind of things. So however it goes uh, is okay. Probably when we're young, we don't uh, hope that the world will end for a while because we want to get so older or we want to grow, the, grow go through this or experience that and so on and so forth. Uh, but as we get older, of course, and we see more and more things, we're not so sure anymore. And if he ends today, it's okay. You know. But that kind of comes as you get older, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. When we were graduating from the seminary and looking forward to getting married, if within the next two months or something like this, we were not asking for the end of the world <laughs> at that time, you know. But all of that's bad. All of that's past. So... But we can't be selfish. We let that <clears throat> let the Lord decide that and determine that Himself. So this kind of brings us now to the end of the of our study of our our Lord's life, the state of humiliation, the state of exaltation. <clears throat> We've looked at this great V, and uh, out of that comes <clears throat> victory and the gift of salvation. All of those things that we've talked about, but. In his coming and his living and his doing and his rising from the dead and ascending back to heaven, all those kind of things. <clears throat> he brought so many gifts to us, and as a result of that, there are so many th blessings we have. That's what we're going to start talking about today, and we'll talk about uh, these uh, primarily next week, too. It's going to take us uh, these hours now to cover everything that he has done for us. And the first great gift, and we're going to look at that yet this afternoon, the first great gift, of course, that he brings to us is the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. And that's in the, uh, that's in the creed too, isn't it? Holy Christian Church, um, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. That in Christ Jesus and all that he did for us, we have the forgiveness of sins. Now... We have to understand what sin does before we can understand why forgiveness is such a blessing. What is the consequence of sin? Why is sin, sin? Think of that. Why is sin, sin? Why is anything called a sin? Sin is sin because it separates. What makes sin, sin, is that it either separates us from God or separates us from each other. Now, there's lots of things that different churches say are sin, uh, which are not sin, because they are not, they're not things that separate us from each other. You know, wearing jewelry doesn't separate us from each other. There are denominations who say that's a sin. Or, you know, having the... the Long, men having long hair or beards or all kinds of stuff you see or tattoos they'll say that kind of stuff is sin but it is not you see that doesn't separate us from people what makes sin sin is that it separates us from people and so sin first of all separates us from God 
and then it separates us from each other. Now the question is, how do you overcome that separation? Well, you overcome that separation only through forgiveness, only be by being forgiven. The person who is sinned against must do the forgiving, which means this, he must do the connecting. You see, if sin separates, if sin separates, the answer to that separation then is reconnection. And Christ Jesus, of course, is the one who brings about this reconnection. Here is God, okay, and here is the sin, our sin that separates us, and here's us, and here's Christ Jesus who comes in between and takes our sin upon himself and dies under the judgment that's against that sin, and he then becomes our connection to God our Father. But sin separates, and the only way that, like I said, that you can overcome that is if the person who has sinned against forgives. Now that's on a human level too. You know, for instance, for instance, everything has been going, let's say, just wonderful between my wife and I, and we've been having just such great, wonderful days. We've had these two or three days where everything has just gone wonderful. There's not been any kind of uh, disagreement or any kind of whatever you would call it, and it's just wonderful. But now, this morning, she burns the toast. And I think to myself, good gracious, this lady's been making toast for 30 years, and she burns the toast this morning. Already, when I've thought that, I'm already thinking, what's wrong with her? What have I done already? I am separating myself from her because I'm sinning against her, huh? I'm accusing her and putting her down mentally, huh? But is that sin? Yes, mentally I'm putting her down, mentally I'm accusing her, <coughs> mentally I'm making fun of her, whatever, all of that in my head. And I've already separated myself from her by my thoughts. Because we sin against God by thought, word, and deed, don't we? Now, I can take that even farther, can't I? And I can say, can't you make toast? It's been 30 years now and you still can't make toast? And what have I done? I have now separated myself from her, how? Verbally, huh? Verbally, because I've put her down and I've made her feel bad and hurt and all those kind of things. Now I can really get stupid and I can take the toast and throw it on the floor or do something really like this, can't I? And now I've just escalated the thing. Now, I've put her down mentally, I've put her down now um, um, uh, words-wise and so on and so forth. Now. I have separated myself from her. How am I going to ever work this out? I can say to her, I'll buy you a new Cadillac if you'll forgive me. And she can say what? That's not enough. Hmm? Can I buy her forgiveness? There's no way that I can buy her forgiveness. Is it? Forgiveness is always a gift from the one sinned against, huh? Now, if she forgives me and says, I forgive you, in her mind and however, that's an act of grace and mercy, isn't it? It's an act of mercy in that she doesn't punish me for it myself. She doesn't punish me for my sin against her. It's an act of grace because she does that freely. See, that's the difference between grace and mercy. But she doesn't punish me, and she gives me this wonderful gift of forgiveness, which comes from her grace, her big heart, see. So it all, that's what it is. Forgiveness is now, she reconnects. She does the connecting. I can't do the connecting because I'm the one who's done the sinning. I can't connect, huh? She has to do the connecting. Now it's the same thing here. You see, God, we sinned against him. Jesus now takes the consequences of that sin because God is holy and sin cannot exist in his place. And so Jesus takes our sin upon us, dies for our sin, takes the consequences of our sin, and reconnects us. Now, God is my Father now, and through Jesus Christ, I am a forgiven person. How long? Always. I live now as a forgiven person. Now listen to this question. Am I forgiven because I ask for forgiveness? Or am I forgiven because I already have forgiveness? Why do I ask for forgiveness if I'm already a forgiven person? 
and through Jesus Christ, I am a forgiven person always. Huh? I ask for forgiveness to acknowledge my sin and to ask the Lord for help in overcoming that, recognizing that. My asking for forgiveness doesn't bring forgiveness. I am already forgiven. My asking for forgiveness simply says to the Lord, I know I am a sinner and I know that you have forgiven me. And I want you now to help me rise above this so that I don't, you know, keep doing this type of thing. So I'm always a forgiven person. I'm always a forgiven person, huh? Yeah. Now, the Apostle Paul then goes into this question. Does that mean that I'm always a forgiven person? Then does that mean that I can sin and do anything I want? And the Apostle Paul says, of course not. Once you've realized God's wondrous grace and that he is a forgiving God, and he loves you so much that he's done all of these things for you. You don't take advantage of his grace. You don't take advantage of his love. Because that would then say the very opposite, you see. No, I want to live for him. I want to do my best. I want to keep his word. I want to love my brother and all of these things because of what he's done for me. So my motivation for good is not in order to earn something from him. My motivation for good is that I've already been given so much by him, see? So I don't come to church on Sunday morning in order to get in good with God. I don't come to church on Sunday morning uh, to pile up brownie points and God's going to save me. He has already saved me. He has already forgiven me. I come to church on Sunday morning because I'm thankful, because I have such a wonderful God. I want to praise him because I want to worship him. I want to hear what he has to say. So you see, it's the opposite. You can be motivated by law, but when you're motivated by law, you're constantly trying to get around the law. When you're motivated by law, you're always trying to do the minimum to get you by. But when you're motivated by the gospel, when you're motivated by what God has done for you, you can't do enough and you're always looking for more that you can do, not in order to save yourself, but just to say thank you in a bigger way. See, so the difference between living by the law or living by the gospel, and you and I as Christians live by the gospel, you see. We live by what God has done for us not our doing something for him. We live by, for, live by what God has done for us. And our lives then are lives of praise and lives of thanksgiving, lives of forgiving our brother and all of those kind of things. So I am a forgiven person. I'm a forgiven person so that I know. And see, this is the answer to about knowing whether you are saved or not. I know that I'm saved, not because of some feeling. I know I'm saved because I have Jesus Christ as my savior and I live today as a forgiven person. I know right now, I know that if I die right now, I'm a forgiven person. I'm going to appear before the Lord, not with sin, but with my forgiveness, see? My sin has already been paid for. It has already been taken away. I don't have anything like that uh, holding me back or whatever you would say. So forgiveness is this tremendously big, big gift, you see. God is my father now, and he knows I'm a sinner. And what does he do? Day after day, he forgives me. Hmm? He forgives me. Another way of looking at this is as, this, as, as Christians, and we don't sin deliberately. We just don't, you know, you, you're, you're struggling not to sin. You're struggling to be the person that God calls you to be. And, um, and so you're not deliberately doing things that you know are contrary to God's will and way. In other words, Christians sin, and they do sin, and we do sin but it's like spitting up on ourselves. You know, a baby spits up on itself. The baby doesn't spit up on itself because it wants to spit up. And, you know, it doesn't say, the baby doesn't say, I'm going to spit up so my mama won't have to clean me up or whatever. The baby just spits up. What does the mother do? She doesn't throw the baby out and say, I don't like your spitting up. I don't like your stinky mess. I'm just going to throw you out. The mother does what? She cleans up the baby, doesn't she? She washes up the baby and puts good smelling stuff on the baby. Because spitting up does not destroy the relationship of mother and child. And so also at this point, because I have Jesus Christ as my Savior, my sins of weakness do not take away my sonship. I am still God's son. I am still God's child. And so he cleans me up. 
day after day <coughs> with forgiveness. I am a forgiven person. But that's the motivation to live differently. See, the motivation to live for Christ is not a law. Jesus did not come and say, here's 52 laws that you must keep to be mine and for me to love you. Jesus comes and says, I love you. I'm going to the cross for you. I'm dying for you. I forgive you and I give to you the gift of heaven. And that's what motivates us then in our living, in our giving, our serving, all those kind of things. That's gospel living. That's gospel use. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty and the wonder of, um, of the gospel. Yeah. Well, we'll go on with this next week. And we're going we're gonna to be looking at a lot of different words next week. Because it takes a lot of words to describe everything that Jesus earned for us on the cross. I don't have a lesson up here with me. So did you get everything filled out? <clears throat> the resurrection of, J of Christ changed the cross from bad news to good news. How many days? 40, 40 days after he arose from the dead Christ Jesus ascended into heaven. In his last words to the disciples, Jesus told them he wanted them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The creed states that the ascended Christ sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. That means that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and that he rules over everything. Romans 8.34 assures us that at the right hand of God, Christ Jesus is interceding or praying for us. The creed reminds us that at the, at the end of time, Christ Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. Talking about last times, Jesus warned the disciples, watch out that no one mislead you. And Mark 13, 32 tells us that the that only the Father knows when the last will be. Not even the not even what? Angels nor the Son. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.